Okay. Welcome everyone to session two of this uh, Means of Grace class on marriage and ministry. Uh, we are going to pick up where we left off last week, but before we do anything else, Josh has an offering for us. So Josh. Oh, wait, oh wait, did you get, did you get a cat? Get a cat? <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. I, I like I can't do anything. Like I, I can't woodwork. I can't fix cars. I can't play an instrument. I can't carry a tune. You make me feel incredibly inadequate, Josh. And since we are talking about marriage, I hope your wife appreciates you. Give your number. What's the what's the correct answer to that, Josh? Not as much <laughs> as I appreciate her. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Also, Jason, to answer your question, yes, I have two cats now. They're both so, sitting on my lap here. Say hello, so, everybody. All right. They're pretty I, let the record show. I offered to buy David King a dog. An Australian Shepherd, to be precise, and he got two cats instead. So, that Jason, is I just walk. I wasn't ready. <laughs> I wasn't ready for that yet. 
So I'm going to, uh, the, the first session is available on my website, jasonmichelli.org. And so if you miss the first session, you can find it there. And it's on, uh, it's on the church email as well, if you belong to my congregation. Uh, so we're going to not review. We're just going to press ahead and, and start where we left off. Um, you all will remember that we began last week by surprising you with uh, a marriage liturgy, a same-sex union liturgy um, from the pre-modern church. Uh, I did that so that, so that you know that uh, there are resources out there. Um, <laughs> wow, Zoom fell, Zoom fell. <laughs> Both my cats um, promptly left my lab. Uh, so, so I wanted you to know that there are resources and, and out there and that there is evidence that this is something that the church has been thinking about for hundreds and thousands of years because humans uh, are every bit as human as they were in the ancient world uh, and relationships were every bit as complicated as they are in the 21st century. Um, it says something about our contemporary egotism to think that somehow our lives are more complicated uh, and gray than the lives of the saints who came before us. Uh, and so what I'm gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit more about this and what, what these litur the existence of these liturgies say for how the church thought about marriage um, in the ancient and pre-modern church. Uh, and so these, these liturgies are, are called Adelpho Poesis, uh, it's a Greek term. Um, it literally means the making of brothers. Uh, and so in, in the term itself is a same sex understanding of, of the binding together of, of two people. Um, they, they uh, so, you know, I'll just, you know, the slide here, the church in pre-modern Europe composed liturgies for the office of same sex unions. Some of these liturgies go back as early as the seventh century, um, Jason, which is really a question. <laughs> yes. What is an office? Well, it sounds like you have an answer to that question, David. No, I, I'm asking you. Uh, I am office, a listener. Uh, an office is a form of ministry. So we're thank we're, you, Jason. Yeah. Uh, so some of these liturgies for the ministry of marriage go back to the seventh century. Uh, so you know, in the 600s, which is like a big, big deal when you stop to think about the Nicene Creed only dates to the fifth century. Uh, so the church is composing these liturgies for same-sex uh, relationships um, not that long after, like right, right on the tail of the church discerning how they want to understand uh, the identity of Jesus Christ and his relationship to God um, and and some of the, the more fundamental discussions the church had. Um, the liturgies echo the marriage rites in the Orthodox Church's tradition today. Uh, and so you can see that uh, these liturgies existed in the Eastern half of the church, which eventually became the Orthodox tradition. Um, and so you, you can see parallels between them and the Orthodox tradition today. Um, so here is an example. I'll just read it for our listeners. The priest shall say, for as much as thou, O Lord and ruler, art merciful and loving, who didst establish humankind after thine image and likeness, who didst deem it meet that thy holy apostles Philip and Bartholomew be united, bound one unto the other, not by nature, but by faith and the spirit, as thou didst find thy holy martyrs Serge and Bacchus worthy to be united together, Bless also thy servants, blank and blank, joined together not by bond of nature, but by faith and in the mode of the spirit, granting them peace and love and oneness of mind. Cleanse from their hearts every stain and impurity and vouchsafe unto them to love one another without hatred and without scandal all the days of their lives with the aid of the mother of God and all thy saints for as much as all glory is thine. Um, so that's one. I've got another one here. O Lord, our God, who didst grant uh, unto us all those things necessary for salvation and didst bid us. And I should say like this sentence right here is, is in like, like the Methodist 
wedding liturgy today. O Lord, our God, who didst grant unto us all those things necessary for salvation and didst bid us to love one another and forgive each other. Bless and consecrate, kind Lord, these thy servants who love each other with a love of the spirit and have come into this thy holy church to be blessed and consecrated. Grant them unashamed fidelity and sincere love. And as thou didst vouchsafe unto thy holy disciples and apostles, thy peace and love, bestow them also on these, O Christ our God, affording that affording them to them all those things needed for salvation and life eternal. For thou art the light and truth, and thine is the glory. Uh, there's a important line from that first one I read to you. Cleanse from their hearts every stain and impurity, and vouchsafe unto them to love one another without hatred and without scandal all the days of their lives. Um, so, so part of the instructions uh, for these liturgies um, is that the two uh, to be united together um, would have crowns placed on their heads as part of the ceremony, which is done in the Orthodox Church today, if you've been to an Orthodox wedding. David- It's done most recently in the <laughs> wedding in, uh, in, the, in the, the royal wedding in Russia. Okay, David, what is the symbolism behind this? It's not like a man is the king of his castle. So what does it mean? King in the castle, king in the castle. Uh, <laughs> um, and the Borat, nobody? nobody? No. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, it is, uh, it is like being, it's just like having the, the, the crown of thorns placed on your head. Um, it's supposed to uh, mimic the marriage of Christ the King with the church, the queen. Uh, so you have the two, the two crowns. Okay. That's my understanding of it. But if you want more from that, Jason, I don't have it. Yeah, I, uh, Josh, you, you want to add anything there? I got nothing on that. Okay, well, I, I, uh, okay. I mean, you should have expected um, less of us. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> So uh, class participants and listeners, um, the, so in the wedding liturgies of the East, uh, crowns are placed on bride and groom uh, usually um, in the same way or the, for the same reason that, that you'll see lots of church doors painted red. Um, it is to remind you of the blood, the blood of the martyrs. And so the crowns do not represent um, sort of this kind of hierarchy, hi hierarchy of family that mimics some sort of hierarchy outside of the family um, between Christ and the church and, and us. Um, but rather, um, it is to remind you, it's to remind the participants um, that the faithful saints who, who are often martyred for their witness uh, are given crowns of glory by Christ. Um, and so what that means uh, is that in the, in the early church to the Orthodox Church today, marriage is primarily understood as a form of martyrdom. Um, that it is a form of suffering that produces holiness. Um, and so, you know, so, and, and, and that's, um, and we, we can talk about this more in looking at, you know, the liturgies that we're familiar with in the Protestant church. Um, because again and again, in laying out um, in laying out the, the, the wedding liturgies of the church, the church historically has, when presented with every opportunity to define marriage in terms of gender or nature, the church again and again chooses to, to connect it in a, um, a surprising way to Christ and to, to faithfulness. Um, and so, 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 while it's certainly possible for Christians to have different views of, of, of marriage, um, and it's certainly still true that, that marriage between a man and a woman is the normative assumption in scripture and in the Christian tradition, it is completely unhistoric and wrong to understand marriage in terms of gender, because the Christian tradition just doesn't do it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so that's, notice, notice how in those liturgies, like, like none of it was specifically about any kind of complementarity um, mm -hmm. between uh, uh, the, the two being united. What it was about was filling in 
everything, every place in which they fell short. Um, uh, and, and, and so there, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing unique. There's nothing uniquely gendered about that. Um, and the, the, the other thing is like, you know, it's, it's the, the symbolism of the, of the crown, of the crowns, um, especially when in read in light of the crown of thorns and in light of the, the tradition of martyrdom. Um, it's, it's all about pointing away, pointing at Christ, having whatever the union is, whoever the subjects are, um, what the purpose of the ceremony is not um, to bring man and, man and woman together for the sake of procreation, right? It is to witness to, um, to the, the one who bore away the sins of the world. Josh, talk about, um, I have a little bullet point there, um, doing some theology on people. Marriage is a means of grace and it provides a sanctuary where eros can be transformed into agape. Uh, that's, the form, that's, that's the form of suffering that the church understands. What, what, is, what, is, what does this mean? So I understand this to mean um, eros is the form of love that speaks about desire, um, something that, that draws the passions. And agape is the word we associate with Jesus's suffering love, um, unconditional love, love that doesn't count, counts all the costs and is willing to, to give them. Um, so the marriage as a means of grace is a chance for what starts off in attraction because and I want to be careful here. I don't want to minimize this. Um, but typically, eros is the first thing that gets us outside of ourselves, right? We are mm -hmm. selfish creatures by nature. So desire is something that draws you outside of yourself to another. But that desire in and of itself isn't holiness, right? When it's transformed into um, laying your life down for another, then that's where it, eros is transformed into agape. Right? That's really good because uh, so like 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 Paul Zoll talks about how um, erot eroticism, falling in love, is is the best earthly equivalent we have of what it means to be captured by the gospel because it awakens you and it's caused by something outside of you. Yes. Um, and yet and yet the journey then is is to something that resembles something more self giving and sex and sacrificial. Yes. It is ex it is an exact mirror of the movement of the inner life of the Trinity. Boom! That sounds that sounded really smart, David. That's good. Thank you. Um, it's almost like and, and this idea. For <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, you know like um, Stanley Harewas likes to say that like his rule for marriage is that you always marry the wrong person, um, and that's because when you are captured by arrows. Um, you don't like you're so captured by it, a you don't really know like yourself like you shouldn't be making any consequential decisions when you're captured by arrows um, and that's why the wedding liturgy doesn't really ask like about your love for each other um, um, but but when you're captured by arrows like really you're captured by the idea of this person because you don't really know this person um, and so so marriage uh, uh, the, you know the way the church understands it so it's it's it's, it's like a cage like the church puts over two people um, where they have to learn to, over time to love each other as Christ loves us, which means uh, to love your enemy and, and, and to, to love, love, love the sinner and to love the ungodly uh, sides of the person. Um, just before we move on, I just want to note, uh, Bevan, I, I have noted your, your question for next week. Um, and Lavinia, what I said was um, it is a perfect mirror of the movement that is the inner life of the trinity um and what that was in reference to was um jason and josh describing this uh being captured by and awakened by a particular by this erotic form of love and for it to be met with agape and transformed and brought into a different place i mean that is like the threefold movement um uh, that that constitutes the the life of the trinity as love and that's an important point because, and, and I'll add it to the slides for next time, um, that if you go back to some of the Eucharistic prayers of the ancient church, um, 
it, so I get embarrassed singing songs that sound like I'm saying Jesus is my boyfriend, like contemporary Christian songs. Like I'm uncomfortable with those songs. But if you go back to the ancient church's Eucharistic prayers, like the language of desire, like God's desire for Christ, Christ's desire for the Father, the Spirit's desire for them, our desire for Christ, like it's, it's, um, they're woven through with bodily erotic language. Um, and, and so the, the, this idea of, of Eros being a part of the life of God and, and therefore our, our life with God um, is really important and, and is, is absent from a lot of uh, understandings of the faith today. Um, so uh, the marriage vows uh, echo and in Russian theology, they derive almost like, you know, explicitly from monastic vows. We said a little bit about this. To say that marriage is a form of monasticism and that marriage is a form of martyrdom is really like we're saying the same thing, so that it's a form of suffering that is training you towards holiness. Um, and so, you know, for example, monks, you know, because a lot of, I'm assuming most of you haven't been present when like a monk becomes a monk. Um, and so, you know, you might not know that the vows that monks make uh, to their order sound an awful lot like the vows that you made to your husband or your wife or, or whatnot. Um, and so they, they promise poverty, chastity, and obedience. Um, married people promise for richer, for poor, to have and to hold, forsaking all others. Um, you know, so like these, these vows didn't just like appear in like some bridal magazine, but they come out <laughs> of um, monastic liturgies. Um, You're telling uh, me that Hallmark didn't produce this? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, and, and it, so, so this is the other thing too, you know, where we talk about how it's unintelligible to be talking about marriage in the larger church as being between a man and a woman when a whole lot of pastors like Josh and me will marry anybody off the street. Um, and, and, there, and, and a whole lot of, of weddings that happen in churches are done between, between couples who wanna write their own vows. Um, and the reason that's not good, and the reason I say no to it is because once you start writing your own vows, like you've cut the connection um, to this larger tradition of, of monks and nuns and, and faithfulness, um, the, the, that this relationship is, is no different than, you know, someone who decides to go become a Dominican, um, which is definitely the order I would join. Um, oh, so, I'd go Jesuit. Uh, <laughs> You're so worldly. Marriage cultivates concern for one another. Uh, it offers lifelong hospitality, it enacts love, and it exposes our faults in order to heal them. And that, that emphasis on healing is important. Um, so let's, uh, you know, let's look at this for better, for worse, Val. Uh, for better, for worse, for rich, for poor, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part. Um, and so it's important, like I, I made a joke about it a minute ago, um, but what couples come to pastors saying why they want to get married, right, Josh? It's, it's like, we're, we're just so in love. We're just so in love with each other. Um, and, and the best response to that is always like, well, big deal. Like, like I, I don't care. I don't care about that. Like, um, and, 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 and the reason I don't care about it is because you can't promise a, someone a feeling forever. Um, like you're not, you're really not in control of your feelings. And so like, it's foolish to, to promise that to another. Um, and so it's, you know, it, it's important that the church isn't really interested in their erotic love and doesn't ask any questions really about it. Um, instead, what the church historically has done is mark marriage out as an ascetic discipline. Um, that's a big word, David. What does it mean? An ascetic discipline? Ah. Mm -hmm. uh, Oh gosh. Okay. Well, you think I mean, we, we think of asceticism, right? This uh, uh, very sort of barren uh, way of living life. Um, it, it's uh, you cut out a lot of uh, extra things and and survive um, by the grace of God and a little bit of food. Um, and so it, it's so like an ascetic discipline. Um, is a is a discipline that's meant to uh, winnow you down such that you can be opened up. Um, There's a good metaphor there because so early monks were often called spiritual athletes. And the mm. root of ascetic is the word exercise. 
right? So in the same way that Paul that. will That's say great. the the runner trains for the race, right? It's the same idea here. And in the same way that we were talking about that the marriage vows come out of monasticism, uh, an idea familiar to monasticism in this athletic paring down training is this process of uh, what's sometimes called purgation, emptying, mm. illumination, being filled with the light of Christ, moving towards union, right? So in the same way that a, that a monk is saying, I'm going to give myself completely to these disciplines so that I can have union with God, um, there's a similar process going on in holy matrimony. So, and, and, and the way this connects, like we talked last week about how um, the, the, the historic wedding liturgy begins with um, uh, a remembrance of baptism and how marriage is an outworking of baptism. And the, the way that the historic baptismal liturgy flows, it's, you know, so, so after the person is baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, they're then anointed with oil um, as a sign of the Spirit. Um, and, and that goes back to the fact that in the ancient world, uh, you know, so like the original Olympians, right, before they would compete, they would rub their bodies with oil, uh, which sounds kind of gross and maybe homoerotic. I don't know. Um, but that's what we do. That's I mean, what we do to people. Yeah, wrestling. Wrestling. But that's, women. that's you know, so, so it's, and, and this is why, you know, so it's like, this is why it connects, right? That like, like marriage is like an outworking of baptism because the last thing you do to someone who's been baptized is anoint them with oil which is a nod towards the sort of of um athletic struggle uh that david and josh were just talking about um that, that this the, the, like marriage is is one of the routes that christians can take um to suffer for the sake of sanctification um and 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 therefore, so I like to go back, um, you know, so, so like it, it's, it's, you know, I don't think we understand that, that uh, uh, you know, marriage is not something that people just get to do, right, by virtue of their, like, sexuality and, and feelings, um, that, that marriage, like, from the beginning and the life of the church has been understood as medicine to, to make people healthier than than who they were when they entered it. Um, and, and so you can see it in language like, you know, this, this very ancient prayer, cleanse from their hearts every stain and impurity and vouchsafe unto them to love one another without hatred and scandal, um, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and, and so it's, it's, you know, and, and, and therefore, you know, one of the, the things we should be thinking about in terms of uh, this conversation, right, is that, um, I think, uh, so for traditionalists, if you, like, if you have a traditional understanding of marriage, you think the risk is faithfulness to biblical authority, right? Like that's, that's really what this hinges on. Um, but really there's another risk. Um, and, and the risk is if, if this is medicine, like, like, are we denying it yeah, to sick who people? Are you, who are you refraining from denying? Yeah. Um, that like you know the good physicians got some medicine, uh, and and you're you know, maybe you're not letting them go to like certain houses, um, and 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 so uh, there's a level on which like that might be Bible bad too, um, and it's every bit as like it's every bit as a serious a question. I just want, I wanted to say one other thing about on this uh, on this suffering and and martyrdom thing. Like we should be just very clear that this is not. Like we, we, we're not talking about like spousal abuse here, right? You know, like we're not talking about like suffering and just enduring and, and having that be um, sort of reified uh, because that, that, that kind of transposition has caused a lot of damage to people. Um, and so we're, we're talking about suffering that is, that is taking on the suffering of another. Um, and walking with them in it, uh, you know, suffering in the sense of self-giving of, of that, which is lost when one gives oneself over to another. Um, like, so we're not, we're talking about suffering in the sense in which Jesus undergoes suffering. 
Um, yeah, I'm going to give an example, and then Josh, you're married, you can give an example. Uh, so I've got two examples. One, one form of suffering that is marriage is that no one knows how big an asshole I am, like Allison Keller Michelle. So that's example one. Example two is, um, you know, five years ago, I got a terminal illness that I'll never get over, and it completely changed um, what my wife thought her future was. Like we were talking about having a third kid, and that was immediately off the table. Um, and so, so what, you know, so she, she suffers the loss of a kind of future that she imagined. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're talking about. Like we're talking about, um, tying your future to someone. And that means maybe it's not going to be what you thought it was, would be. And you grieve that, um, we're talking about, it might about, not be your future. You yeah. And, and, and we're talking about the pain of being known by someone in ways, mm -hmm. um, that you don't want to be known. Yeah. So what's your example, Josh? <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'll run into this. Um, so there's so many. Um, I can think of another one that's uh, uh, personal to people in this uh, meeting, and that is um, adoption, right? Uh, that completely changes your life, right? Bringing children into a relationship completely changes the dynamic and the future. Um, but that's, it. again, going back to David's language, if it's the kind of thing that's um, entered into, albeit unperfect, imperfectly, but trying to create space and hospitality, um, creating a life for another, and fundamentally changing your identity. We, we kind of joke around when we're meeting with young married couples and saying this is no longer about, you know, me or you, it's about we right? That fundamentally changes the dynamic of the relationship. And as our friend Stanley Harawas likes to say, you have no idea what you're getting into when you say yes at a wedding. There is no way you could, you cannot uh, take the disposition of a liberal democratic society and say, I must be aware, I must be informed, and I must consent to this, because you have no idea what you're getting into when you say yes to marriage. It's something that you can only look back on and then call it love because you, you have come through it. And you can use words like enduring, but, um, but it doesn't mean it, it um, you can still use a word like joy, right? You can say, we've been through, we've been to hell and back. We've been through a lot, but I count it all joy. And you can hear this in um, the, the way people kind of popularly talk, right? Like, oh, she's a saint for putting up with him, <laughs> right? Like, the, mm -hmm. like, I mean, like behind that, like, cliche is, is a really old way of understanding marriage. It, like, it's a, it's a form of making saints. <laughs> like, it's um, because none of us are, you know, none of us are the people that we like to pretend we are, um, which is why, um, and you guys can talk about this, um, I think it's a profound mistake to get hung up on the, well, isn't it a sin question um, in terms of like who can get married? Because the understanding of marriage right here is, is precisely that it's medicine for sinners. And so, so like, like there is no, in terms of just sin, there, there's no like disqualification from entering into it, right? Yeah. I mean, I think you answered your own question. I think maybe I did. I didn't. I didn't mean to. Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's not okay. as. It's not easy to facilitate these team teaching <laughs> things. <laughs> um, okay, so let's. Uh, I, what I've done here, uh, I think we talked about all of this, um, but there, you know, this is you know, um, make their life together a sign of Christ's love to the sinful and broken world that unity may overcome estrangement, forgiveness, heal guilt, and joy conquer despair. That's from the Book of Common Prayer from which United you know, Methodists get their liturgy. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, that harkens back to this idea that we talked about last week, so that, that marriage is both a means of grace for, the, for two different people, um, but it also serves the purpose of the larger church um, to, 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 to point towards a redemption coming to all of us. Uh, 
The vows, the marriage vows signal no privilege or right. They do not treat sexuality as a need to be satisfied. Um, okay, yeah. So part, part of the, the struggle here is I was like, I'm gonna make all the slides for all sessions of the class ahead of time. And now I'm like, I forgot what I wrote. <laughs> um, okay, this is a good, um, this is one of the things I like to, to walk couples through uh, when I'm meeting with them about weddings. Um, and, and all of the wedding liturgies that I'm familiar with, there's, there's a call to worship. And, and in the call to worship, uh, the, the church does some surprising things that I think we're so familiar with, we, we, we they just like go over our heads. Um, and so at the beginning, the church is saying that marriage signifies the mystery of the union between Christ and the church. Um, and so it is, it is uh, a sacrament pointing to a relationship that is not about gender or sexuality. Um, and then, and so, it's, and so like, you know, like Josh, you know this, so like it, 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 it begins hearkening back to um, uh, the story of Genesis. God made us one for another. And so it's not, God doesn't want us to be alone because God is Trinity and God is not alone. Um, and so like, it's, it's almost like a tease, right? It's like, oh, well, yeah, this is about like, you know, Adam and Eve, blah, 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 not Adam and Steve. But, but then no, like it immediately pivots to Jesus began his ministry at a wedding in Cana of Galilee and in his sacrificial love gives us the example for the love of husband and wife. Like talk about how, like, like what the church is doing there. Talk about what the church is doing there. Yeah, like in in in, in teaching uh, the congregation. So, uh, so I, I, again, the the picture in um, Ephesians when Paul is talking about marriage. Only, in my mind, he may be using something from the world as an example, something from Greco-Roman culture, but he doesn't use it in the way that they do it because they may say, "Here are." here's the house Toflin, right? Here's, here's the house rules. This is how just how societies run. But he always takes these things and, and points to Christ. He says that uh, a husband should give himself up for his spouse in the same way that Christ gave himself up for the church. And he says that, um, you know, I'm pointing to a mystery. This isn't really about marriage. This is about your life in Christ, the bride of Christ being the church, and Christ being the king of the universe. It's also interesting when, when we look at, um, we look at Genesis, um, when we look at through Christological lenses, when we read it again, now having seen the new Testament and the work of Christ, there are things that jump off the page. And one of them that I'm thinking about in this moment is, is that in the beginning of the Genesis account, the first one, there's all these, these things that happen by, um, divine fiat you know god just says let there be and there is but the only one that's not is when he puts these humans together that they don't be alone and and he says let us make he doesn't just say let there be he says let us make human beings in our image and and that gets back to that that project here is something that's initiated but it's not something complete it's on the way and I think that, that gets back to that, that picture of Eros and Agape. This project that we enter into where we're not alone is not alone so that, um, hey, will you guys hang out with me so I feel better? I'm feeling lonely today. The grace would be <laughs> in what you would do, right? Oh, Josh isn't feeling good. We'll draw close to him. In, in the relationship, in the marriage, that's what we're doing for our spouse. We're giving up our own needs and desires, drawing outside of ourselves to love somebody else well. Why? Because Christ loves us that way, gave himself up for us. We only know what love is because Christ loved us first. Hmm. That's, you know, like that makes me think of uh, one of the church fathers, Gregory of Nyssa. Um, wrote about how the Adam and Eve before the fall are not the Adam and Eve God intended, right? That had there been no fall, the Adam and Eve God intended would have 
become to other people. Um, and that, so what, what, what you're pointing to, Josh, is both A, um, there is a diversity in creation and they're not accidents. Um, the, the, you know, that everyone, like everything and everyone in creation is not accidental. Uh, and so you can't paint yourself into a corner and say, well, no, the, these people are an aberration um, because that's, that doesn't make any sense theologically. Um, so there's a diversity in creation um, and people with same, you know, is like same sex attraction, like, like those are like, they're a, a fruit of God's creation. Um, but then you're also saying that like, um, that uh, uh, God intends us to be otherwise than who we are right now. And that part of what it means to be creatures um, is to, to grow into that, that icon of God. Um, and because God is three persons, because God is community, the, the primary means we do that is in relationship. Yeah. And, and I just, you know, I don't want to run down a rabbit trail necessarily, but to, to tack on to the end of that, I know for me, it's been powerful over the last decade or so to say, sometimes when we say, um, you know, you were talking earlier about making saints, making holy, sanctifying Sometimes when we think about that in the context of this analogy of being a spiritual athlete, we think of this striving that makes us um, super people, right? Like there's ordinary people and then there's, you know, Christian disciples, (laughs) you know, but in the, in the context, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding of good theology is that sin makes us less than human, right? Mm -hmm. And this process of being filled with the love of Christ and living within self-giving love brings us up to become human, mm. right? I'm, I'm less than human. And I, the holiness that I experience in my relationship, uh, I, I, I sin and I fall short every day. And yet it's making me holy. It's making me more tender. It's, 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 um, it's bringing in some, creating in me something that, um, oh, I'll just stop there. I'll just stop there. No, that's yeah, like, you know, so like, and like C.S. Lewis is the great divorce, which is about heaven and hell. And so like the people in hell are like, they're out of focus. Right. And like, it's, so it's like the, the closer you get to hell, the more like ephemeral and shadowy you get. And it's, it's the people in heaven uh who who are like in sharp focus and that doesn't mean like they're better it just means like they they, they see themselves for who they are and they see other people for who they are and so like they're just more human um that's good it's good um a lot of you know i don't know how common it is uh in a lot of protestant churches to celebrate the eucharist during weddings i've done it uh probably i don't know a quarter of the time a third of the time um and so you might not know the eucharistic prayer for weddings it connects marriage and the eucharist in the same way that the cana thing does it says because in the love of wife and husband you have given us an image of the heavenly jerusalem adorned as a bride for her bridegroom your son jesus christ our lord who loves her and gave himself for her that he might make the whole creation new um and so it's exactly what josh is talking about here that um marriage in the wedding liturgy is understood not in terms of like nature and creation but in terms of of, of the atonement like that's, that's like you know it's 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 hearkening back to the sacrificial work of christ and pointing towards the fulfillment of that in the new jerusalem um david you want to say anything there i i, I stepped no, on it's, your toes. it's good you're fine okay um and then I, you know i made you were saying that, that because you know that i'm growing more and more anglican by the day and you were like you want to comment <laughs> on the eucharist <laughs> um i made a note here too um that uh you know the vows end with till death do us part uh, or or till we are parted by death is what it says um mm. which gives death gives death a, a more agency um and a lot of times again couples want to take that out because it's it's not sexy it's not romantic it's kind of a downer um, but the reason it's, but it, the reason it's in there is because like, well, A, Jesus says, you know, you're not going to be married to your spouse in heaven. And B, uh, there's this awareness that, that because marriage is 
uh, a form of witness because marriage is a form of monasticism and a means of grace. It's, 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 it's temporary. It's not this eternal thing. It, it's, it's, it's a form of ministry that serves a purpose. And so exactly in the way, Josh, that there is no temple in the new Jerusalem because like your relationship with God no longer needs to be mediated in the city of God. God's just living with everybody. Um, it's one big happy family. That's in the book of Revelation, people. Uh, in the same way, there's no temple in the New Jerusalem. There is no need for, mi- for, for marriage in the New Jerusalem because the purpose of marriage is now fulfilled. Yeah. So, so again. I would okay. also, just on the, on the, on the death oh, thing, yeah. like, Jump like in. part of it is like, part of it is our reticence to say that we, that like the people getting married are not whole human beings, you know? Um, because when people have been married for some time um, and one of them dies, the other dies as well, literally. And, and I mean, not, lit- mm-hmm. not literally in the sense of, you know, the, the physical literalness, but there is a part of them that dies with that person which is to say that their wholeness who they had come to be in that unity something had been taken away by the power of death which stands opposed to our becoming whole through of the, through each other hmm. um and so like the the assumption is going into the marriage ceremony that you are not whole people that what is making you whole is the union and the perseverance in the union, um, which is made manifest, especially um, in in the in the ways in which you know we see people, the grief that people suffer uh, on the loss of their partner. That can happen. There's also, I think that. Um, so when I think of death, um, so a. a, a a corrupted form of love would be one that lives only for self gratification. Mm-hmm. Right. And when I think in those terms, one of the chief of sins is possession, right? You're mine, right? The, the, how can I be jealous towards this? Um, you know, you're here for me. And now that you're gone, look what you've done to me. Right. But there's also a kind of death that can be ego death, you know, the, yeah. the death that uh, opens up. Um, I, I'm not lacking anything, even in, in singleness, right? I, I am, um, there is a way in that, that this process, that this love has transformed me. And so I don't cling so tightly to those things. I'm, I'm free and open. That's good. That's good. Uh, here, here's uh, another little ancient bit. Um, it's uh, from On the Lament of the Mother of God. Uh, it says, be patient a little longer, mother, and you will see how, like a physician, I reach the place where they lie, and I treat their wounds, cutting with the lance, their calluses and their scabs. I take the vinegar, I apply it as a stringent to the wound, when with the probe of the nails I have investigated the cut. I shall plug it with the cloak. And with my cross as a splint, I shall make use of it, mother, so that you may chant with understanding. By suffering, he has abolished suffering, my son and my God. Uh, that is uh, a little allegorical way of describing how the spirit, like a physician, attends to uh, the wounds of sin in a married couple. Um, and so just to reiterate the point that we've been making here, if marriage is uh, a means of grace, it, if it's medicine, that the great physician applies to make us more human. Um, should we be reticent about denying that to other people? Um, and if you're wondering what it, like all this is about, um, what we've been saying so far, it, I think it's two things. One, uh, we are saying that um, every which way you go, to look at how Christians have conducted wedding worship services. Uh, They have deliberately chosen not to understand marriage in in an exclusively gendered way. Um, And yet 
that's how the contemporary church chooses to engage the debate. And so there's a discontinuity uh, between how we conduct this debate and how the ancient church has understood the, this, this, this thing. Um, and that uh, the church has primarily understood uh, marriage, not as the expression of the love between a man and a wife or two people even, um, but as an opportunity for people to grow in grace because all of us are, the old Adam is strong in all of us mm -hmm. and we need the spirit's help to pull us out uh, of the waters in which we were drowned uh, and to, to grow into uh, a, a, a human likeness. Um, and then I've got a few more slides, but I want to go back to this because I, I forgot to mention it. And I think it's important. Um, these liturgies, uh, Adelpho Poesis, the, the, the making of brothers. I, I know a lot of you will have questions about like, well, how many, how many people did the church do these unions for? How common was it? Um, was it understood that these two people would, would have sex or was it understood that they would live celibate lives together? Um, and there's really no answers for those questions, except to say that, um, you know, like Josh, how many blessings of homes have you done in your ministry? Oh, I don't know. Um, 20, I don't know. How many blessings of animals have you done? Oh, uh, it's a liturgical service, not many. <laughs> <laughs> As a pastor in the home of a parishioner, many. How many anointing with oil uh, to the sick or the dying have you done? I couldn't give you a number. It's too large. Okay. Um, uh, so, so like David, you can say more about this. There's a, a a phrase that the ancient church and the church contemporary has always used, um, uh, lex orandi, lex credendi. And anytime the church whips out its Latin, you know, it's important. Uh, <laughs> and it means, it means the, the rule of prayer is the rule of belief. Um, and that's a way of saying that if you want to know what the church really thinks about something, you, you look at how they worship. You don't mm -hmm. look at what their state, state of beliefs are. You don't go to like scripture. You, right. you go to like the actual proof of how they live out their beliefs. Um, and so, uh, you know, in the same way that there is a blessing of, of animal service in the liturgy, and it's like, you know, it comes up once a year, and some churches do it, some churches don't. Um, it, the sheer fact that these liturgies exist in the life of the church shows you that even though other people were saying, no, 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 no you can't do that, the prayer life of the church shows that, well, no, this is actually what they believed, um, that they, 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 countenance this as a possible form of, of ministry and witness right david you want to say any more about that no that was yeah that's good can um I, go ahead Josh. Can I read a little a little paragraph it's brief um mm -hmm. but that way we can end where we begin and i didn't even plan this <laughs> <laughs> um the the song that i sang tonight was called waste um and and the refrain in the song is i want to waste my time with you Marva Dawn was a, uh, a worship professor, and she wrote this book called Worship is a, is a Royal Waste of Time. And I just want to read you this one paragraph. To worship the Lord, in the world's eyes, waste of time. It is indeed a royal waste of time, but a waste nonetheless. By engaging in it, we don't accomplish anything useful in our society's terms. Worship ought not to be construed in a utilitarian way. Its purpose is not to gain members, nor for our churches to be seen as successful. Rather, the entire reason for our worship is that God deserves it. Moreover, it is even useful for earning points with God, for what we do in worship won't change one whit how God feels about us. We will always still be helpless sinners caught in our endless inability to be what we should be or to make ourselves better. And God will always still be merciful, compassionate, and gracious, abounding in steadfast love, and ready to forgive us as we come to him. I think that there's, just as you're talking about lex orande, lex credende, you know, sh show me what you believe by how you worship, how you pray, what you do. Um, you know, 
to give our lives to this could be considered a waste of time. But I believe it's a royal waste of time. I believe that there's something that doesn't make good earthly sense from it. But it's, mm. it's, um, it's beautiful. And as Dostoevsky told us, beauty will save the world. The beauty of Christ. And I think that that's um, one form of that, one form to experience that sanctification process is through marriage as a means of grace to waste your time um, loving to the utmost another human being um, and, and not in a self-gratifying way, but in a self-giving way, you become something, something beautiful. That's, um, so I would say, and we've just unintentionally ended on my last slides here, um, that it's not just one of the ways um, that we, we imitate Christ, but the, like marriage is, the, is, is, is ground zero for the opportunity to, to imitate the way of Christ. Um, mm. And so, you know, like it, it's, 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 you know, it's not necessarily the only, but it's the only reliable relationship we have where we will have to suffer the, the sins and faults of another um, and to, to substitute ourselves um, for someone who doesn't deserve it, um, to, to, to know who someone really is and yet choose to love them um, at great cost. Uh, and so it's, it's, you know, to, you know, so it's, it's like to say, well, you know, the way our book of discipline does this is just me in my personal opinion to, to say well if, if that's if that's who you are you you just need to be celibate um celibacy is a, a form of monasticism that can be self-chosen but to impose it on another person is is to deny them the opportunity uh for a ministry in which they imitate christ and and therefore become more christ-like mm. um so it's 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 uh yeah, it's. I mean, it's, it's no different than denying them the Eucharist. <laughs> you know, like it's, yeah, yeah, it's like right. no, not for you, not for you. Sorry. Um, uh, and so, withholding the implications is a good place for us to pick up next time when we talk about ministry um, more generally. Yeah. So, David, pray us out. Sure. Let us pray. Dear God, you who have drawn closer to us than we could ever draw to you, you who have emptied yourself, poured yourself out that we might be filled, you who have not only known our sufferings, but taken them on in your very body. Lord, we ask that as we go forward from this night, that your spirit would move and transform us to be mirrors of that image. that you would give to each of us the grace that is necessary and even more. Transform us into the image of your son that we might better see the image of your son in each other. And Lord, especially bless all those who are married may their suffering together produce not strife, but joy. And may you work in witness through them. We pray all of this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So David, do you have uh, everyone's questions for next time? I, I only had, um, we only had one. Oh, okay. 
Uh, John, Josh, is Worship is a Waste of Time? Is that a book? It's a book by Marva, M-A-R-V-A, Dawn, D-A-W-N, A Royal Waste of Time. Okie doke. Did she write this? Who, who wrote, who did the song that you sang? Oh, um, Fish does it. Dave Matthews. <laughs> oh, wow. Fish. That's funny. <laughs> oh, man. That's funny. Wow. You are a man of my age. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love jam bands, but I, I, I don't care for fish at all. Like I went to one fish concert and they pulled out a vacuum cleaner as well. Like I was like, I can't do this. This is this is awful. This is it's awful. just avant garde, Jason. You just don't get it. It's I, uh... like the the it's the rock equivalent of Ornette Coleman. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, some for, people love jazz. Don't music. don't dump on Ornettes. Don't dump on Ornettes. It it just sounds like geese. Honking. There are many it great things like... about free jazz. <laughs> my uh I, I took my wife I, I went through my own process of um not loving it and then became a big fan and then drifted away from it but i took my wife and uh we actually attended one of the concerts that they made into a double cd from hampton where we used to go to conference mm, i have that yeah mm. yeah so we were at that show and um she was miserable and to this day, you mentioned the word fish and she just cursed under her breath. <laughs> I, I, um, Why did you I bring took, me in the wilderness to die? <laughs> I, I took Allie and then my brother-in-law and sister-in-law, Mike and Laura Page, and a couple of friends to, uh, it's like one of the many times I've seen the drive-by truckers, but I took them to see the drive-by truckers at the 930 Club. And... <laughs> And it, like, you know, like they'll just play without stopping in between songs for five hours. <laughs> and, and my, my brother-in-law was like standing against the wall because his back was hurting him. <laughs> and um, I, I loved it though. Gosh, I love them so much. Oh. Uh, and you know what else I love? I love doing these classes with you guys. So, and that's, I know that sounds sarcastic because sarcasm is my love language, but I actually mean that, so. Uh, and I appreciate all the questions and feedback I got last week. Um, so thank you to all of you. And uh, David, uh, I don't know, given what we know about Bill Cosby, if you should be wearing a Cosby sweater. But, oh my God. Uh, oh my God. Now I can't wear this anymore. <laughs> oh, I, you, I hope, oh I, come on, man. <laughs> this is like my favorite one. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Do you have any jello pudding pops in the kitchen? Oh. Wait a minute. <laughs> oh. oh, that's the worst thing you've ever done to me. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Good to be with you guys tonight. Yes, yes. It's always a pleasure. Peace bye, bye. be with you.